Communist society, value, labor, and time, a reply to Gilles Dauvé. This is from the Lefcom um, website or the ICT website. In all social systems of production, the social relations of production are primary, while those of distribution are derived from them. The defining characteristic of communist society will be that it has communist or socialist relations of production. The key task in the replacement of capitalist society by communist society is therefore to establish communist relations of production. Once communist relations of production have been created, communist relations of distribution will follow. The relations of distribution are, consequently, a secondary issue while those of production are primary. Much of the recent discussion on the transition to communist society has focused on the system of distribution in the lower phases of communism, as if this was the key issue, whereas it is, in fact, a derivative issue. As Marx notes, the communal character of production would, from the outset, make the product into a communal general one. The exchange initially occurring in production, which would not be an exchange of exchange values, but of activities determined by communal needs and communal purposes, would include from the beginning the individual's participation in the communal world of products. Labor would be posited as general labor prior to exchange i.e. the exchange of products would not in any way be the medium mediating the participation of the individual in general production. Once relations of production become communal, products become communal also. They are common property of the freely associated producers and in full communism, they will be distributed free on the basis of need. The distribution of products is the outcome of the condition of production themselves or the conditions of production themselves. As Marx emphasizes in his critique of the Gotha program, any distribution whatever of the means of consumption is only a consequence of the distribution of the conditions of production themselves. The latter distribution, however, is a feature of the mode of production itself. The capitalist mode of production, for example, rests on the fact that the material conditions of production are in the hands of non-workers in the form of property in capital and land. While the masses are only owners of the personal condition of production, of labor power, if the elements of production are so distributed, distributed, then the present day distribution of the means of consumption results automatically. To change the mode of production, the nature of labor itself must be changed. Wage labor, which is a defining feature of capitalism, must be abolished. Under the system of wage labor, as pointed out in the quotation above, a worker owns nothing but his labor power. Under capitalism, this labor power takes the form of a commodity, which the worker is forced to exchange for wages, which are in turn exchanged for food, shelter, and other means of consumption. These serve to reproduce the worker's labor power and allow the cycle to start again. However, the actual labor produced by workers' labor power belongs to the capitalist class. Labor is embodied in the products of the production process. When these products are exchanged, they become commodities and the abstract labor embodied in them is attached to them as their value. Labor in this process takes the form of value. Since workers' labor becomes embodied in the commodities produced and these are the property of the capitalist class, workers' labor also becomes the property of the capitalist class. This process is one in which workers' labor is alienated. Marx points out that, under capitalist production relations, labor can only become social labor because it is alienated. In the Critique of Political Economy, he writes, Commodities are the direct products of isolated, independent individual kinds of labor, and through their alienation in the course of the of individual exchange, they must prove that they are general social labor. In other words, on the basis of commodity production, labor becomes social labor only as a result of the universal alienation of individual kinds of labor. This alienation of labor allows it to become labor in the abstract. In the same work, Marx criticizes the proposal of Benjamin Franklin's to use labor time instead of metallic money. Marx notes that labor can only serve as a measure of value if it is alienated labor. 
The labor contained in exchange value is abstract universal social labor, which is brought about by the universal alienation of individual labor. He, Franklin, necessarily fails to recognize in money the direct embodiment of this alienated labor. Money represents exchange value of labor in the abstract and can only do this since it is the embodiment of alienated labor. In communist society, labor must be directly social, producing social products which will be freely distributed on the basis of social need. Labor will therefore produce social use values, but not exchange values. Labor, therefore, cannot take the form of value, nor can products of labor take the form of commodities. If labor cannot take the form of value, money cannot exist as a medium of circulation. The premise that labor cannot take the form of value under communism is a funda fundamental tenet of Marxism. If labor does take the form of value, the new society will remain a type of capitalism, as occurred in Russia and all its later imitators. This axiom is generally expressed in the statement that in communist society, the law of value will no longer operate. Despite these being fundamental tenets of Marxism, various critics of Marx's writings about future communist society claim his prescriptions for this society preserve the value form and are at best contradictory or at worst prescriptions for new forms of capitalism. That is to say they preserve the law of value. That such a penetrating analyst of value as Marx should have made such a fundamental error is implausible, but not, of course, impossible. It is therefore necessary to review the basis of these criticisms. What follows is based on one of these critics, Gilles Dauvé, and his text, Value, Time, and Communism. Use Value and Exchange Value Gilles Dauvé argues Marx is confused about the abolition of value and criticizes his view of labor and labor time. He correctly states that Marx wants communist society to be one in which production is production of use values without exchange values. Although Gilles Dauvé recognizes that Marx was clear that the law of value was the key determinant of exchange values, he claims his proposals for post-capitalist society amounts to a retention of the law of value. Gilles Dauvé employs two main lines of argument to support this. Firstly, he argues that Marx saw value as arising in the market after production is complete, but not in the production process. Marx describes the process as if value, instead of being born out of a very specific type of production, came after the productive moment and imposed itself upon work as an exterior constraint. He argues that since value arises in production, all labor necessarily produces value and hence exchange value. Further, he notes that Marx asserts, labor is a necessary condition independent of all forms of society for the existence of the human race. If this is the case, it follows that communist society will require labor. If communist society requires labor, then value will be produced in the labor process and the law of value will operate. If the law of value operates, the system of production will lead straight back to capitalist production. Consequently, Gilles Dauvé reproaches Marx, Marx for saying that labor is necessary in all forms of society. He claims in the text mentioned above that Marx did not want to abolish the labor capital reunion, but only wanted to liberate work from capital. Gilles Dauvet wants communism to eliminate labor itself and claims this was the view of the young Marx in the 1840s, but was a view contradicted by the older Marx of the 1870s. To support this, he quotes from the German ideology, the communist revolution is directed against the preceding mode of activity, does away with labor and abolishes the rule of all classes. Whereas in the critique of the Gotha program, we read that, in a higher form of communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and with it the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished. Labor has become not only a means of life, but itself life's prime want. After the productive forces have also increased with the all-round development of the individual, and the springs of cooperative wealth flow, from, flow more abundantly, 
Only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and society inscribe on its banners, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. The second line of argument Gilles Dauvé advances is, is a theoretical one. Gilles Dauvé impl implies that Marx made a theoretical mistake in imagining that exchange value could be abolished without abolishing use value. Exchange value, Gilles Dauvé asserts, encompasses use value. He says, but use value is an analytic category, both opposed to and encompassed by exchange value. It is impossible to do away with one without doing away with the other. Since use value is an analytic category, exchange value, which encompasses it, must also be an analytic category and consequently cannot be abolished without abol abolishing use value. Both these arguments are wrong. The first argument that starts with the premise that Marx saw value as arising in the process of circulation, that is, the market. This premise is simply incorrect. The principal postulate of the labor theory of value is that values are determined by labor time, and labor time is the time devoted to production. What the market does is convert value into exchange value by relating commodity, commodities to each other in terms of their abstract value. Marx shows in the first chapter of Capital that exchange values are crystallizations of homogeneous human labor. Exchange value is the phenomenal form of human labor in the abstract and is measured by labor time. Value is clearly seen as created in production and as Marx states, it is not the exchange of commodities which regulates the magnitude of their value, but the magnitude of their value which determines their exchange proportions. The market under capitalism equates various types of labor to each other by reducing them to human labor in the abstract. A certain amount of weaving is equal to a certain amount of fishing, etc., and this proportion is what the market manifests. The value of labor which has gone into the production process is congealed in the commodities produced. When these commodities are brought to market, the market carries out the social function of relating various labor activities to each other. It does this by assigning an exchange value to each commodity in accordance with amount of abstract human labor congealed in it. The aggregate sum of human labor in society is consequently divided up by the market and human activities are related to each other by the exchange values which the market assigns to commodities. Marx, contrary to Gilles Dauvet's assertion, does insist that value is produced in production by labor. The market forms the role of equating various types of labor by reducing all to the measure of human labor in the abstract. If human labor in the abstract did not exist in the commodities when commodities were brought to market, the market could not equate them. Human labor in the abstract is therefore produced by labor in the production process and not by the market. Gilles Dauvé Gilles Dauvé claims that Marx did not wish to abolish the labor capital relationship. This is such an extraordinary statement, one can only conclude that it must be the result of careless writing. Marx's entire work, including his study of capitalist society, was directed towards the abolition of capitalist society and the ending of the capital labor relationship. Marx wished to abolish wage labor, but recognized that labor was needed in all forms of human society and would be needed in communism. In the Grand Reis, Marx for the first time drew a distinction between labor power and labor. This was a key theoretical advance. It led to his realization that labor power appeared as a commodity in capitalist society and like other commodities had an exchange value and was exchanged in the market. However, the labor produced by this labor power when incorporated in the product of labor had a greater exchange value than the labor power which produced it. This exposes the secret of surplus value and exploitation, which lies at the heart of capitalism. It is important to realize that when Marx wrote his earlier works, such as the German ideology, this discovery had not been made and his ideas were less developed. As Gilles Dauvet, Dauvet noted, Marx in the German ideology writes that the revolution will do away with labor. But even though the distinction between labor power and labor had not been made, it is still quite clear that it is labor under capitalism, namely wage labor, which Marx wishes to see abolished. 
A page before the quotation Gilles Dove cites, we read, In a revolution, the proletariat rids itself of everything that still clings to it from its previous position in society. Only at this stage does self-activity coincide with material life, which corresponds to the, de to the development of individuals into complete individuals and the casting off of all limitations. The transformation of labor into self-activity corresponds to the transformation of the earlier limited intercourse into the intercourse of individuals as such. It can be seen from the quotation above that Marx envisages a society where labor is self-activity, self-development, and development of human potential. In the critique of the, of the Gotha program quoted above, Marx indicates how some of these things could be achieved. He speaks of the ending of the division of labor and the an an antithesis of physical and mental labor and a situation where the springs of cooperative wealth flow abundantly. As Marx states, labor is a necessary condition for the existence of humanity, but labor in communist society will be a labor of a different quality, self-expression and self-development and self-fulfillment instead of the antagonistic, brutal, and mentally degrading labor of capitalism. In the later works, it is more clearly labor under capitalist relations of production and its existence as labor power, which Marx wishes to see abolished. Throughout his works, Marx returns to his hypothetical society of freely associated producers who produce communal products and whose labor is directly social. Yet labor exists none, nonetheless. Gilles Dove sees all labor as producing value and the social relations of production are simply irrelevant. He wishes to see labor as such abolished. However, it is somewhat perverse to look to Marx's early writings to find support for this position when his later studies led him to produce more precise and developed analyses and consequently more developed pr prescriptions of what needed to be done to replace capitalism. The second argument advanced by Gilles Dove also appears extraordinary, not only from the perspective of the greater works of Marx, but in view of chapter one of Capital, volume one, from which Gilles Dove himself quotes extensively in his text. In this chapter, Marx takes great pains to show that exchange value does not encompass use value, but that it is attached to use value because of the social relations of capitalist production. Marx states, the existence of commodities as values is purely social. Value is the result of the form which human labor takes under capitalism. Labor appears as a property of commodities themselves, since it assumes a form which permits commodities to exchange. It becomes attached to them as exchange value. The social relations between producers appear as social relations between commodities by, vir by virtue of their exchange values. To view exchange value as attached to use value by labor in the production process, and consequently as a property of the product, as Gilles Dove does, is to make the mistake for which Marx criticized Smith and Ricardo. It is the failure to go beyond appearances and to accept the fetishistic nature of commodities, which results from capitalist production. At the end of Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1, Marx considers other social forms in which products of labor neither take the form of commodities nor have exchange value. He points out that use values, which a person makes for himself, as the famous Robinson Crusoe does, are not commodities and do not have exchange values. A further example he gives is that of the peasant patriarchal household, which preceded capitalism. Here we find a division of labor which results in the production of use values for the family, but the clothes, food, and other products are not commodities and do not have exchange value. The final and certainly the most significant example from our point of view is a, is a society of associated producers. This society is almost identical to that which Marx identified as the lower stage of communism in his critique of the Gotha program, where associated producers produce social products which are use values but not exchange values. In all these examples, we see use values produced by labor which do not have exchange values stamped on them. 
By saying use value is an analytic category, Gilles Dauvé is asserting that an analysis of the products of human labor would reveal that they contained the quality use value. In philosophical terms, the subject, namely the products of human labor, contains the predicate use value. While this is correct, Gilles Dauvé goes on to simply assert, without explanation, that this subject also contains the predicate exchange value. Hence, he concludes the abolition of the predicate exchange value cannot be achieved without abolition of the subject, namely labor, or to put it simply, only by the abolition of labor can exchange value be abolished, which is the conclusion Gilles Dauvé is aiming for. Gilles Dauvé is consequently claiming Marx made a fundamental philosophical mistake in arguing that use value could be produced without exchange value. Marx had not realized, he implies, that both use value and exchange value are predicates of human labor. It is again implausible to argue that Marx, whose entire works are underpinned by the philosophical studies of his early life, would have made such egregious error. But has he, in fact, made this error? Marx himself shows in the examples given above that products of human labor do not necessarily contain exchange value. They only do so under capitalist production relations. Exchange value does not, therefore, as Gilles Dauvé asserts, encompass use value, nor is it an analytic category of the products of human labor. Exchange value is a social category and will disappear with new social production relations. Labor time and disposable time. We have seen from the discussion above that labor in itself does not entail the production of value. It only does so under capitalist relations of production. Gilles Dauvé claims that not only labor, but also the measuring of labor in terms of time ensures labor will express itself in the form of value as in capitalism. He concludes, labor time is capitalist blood labor time. It is the substance of value. If labor itself ensures the production of value, as Gilles Dauvé argues, the question of how it is measured is, a some, is somewhat irrelevant. However, it is measured, and even if it is not measured at all, we will end up with production of value and hence with capitalist relations of production. Such an absurd and ahistorical position, which is the conclusion of Gilles Dauvé's argument, is not, of course, the outcome he is aiming for. His unstated implication is that only labor, which is not measured by time, could be considered as free and could lead to communist production. This, of course, is in contradiction to Marx's writings on post-capitalist society. In the Grundrisse, Marx writes, On the basis of communal production, the determination of time remains, of course, essential. The less time the society requires to produce wheat, cattle, etc., the more time it wins for other production material or mental economy of time to this all economy ultimately ultimately reduces itself society likewise has to distribute its time in a purposeful way in order to achieve a production adequate to its overall needs thus economy of time along with the planned distribution of labor time among the various branches of production remains the first econo economic law on the basis of communal production it becomes law there to an even higher degree. However, this is essentially different from a measurement of exchange values, labor or products by labor time. Marx considers it as axiomatic that communist society will require planning and labor will have to be distributed in accordance with a social plan. To plan effectively, it will be necessary to have a measure of labor and this will be by labor time. He also points out that this is essentially different from a measurement of exchange values by labor time. Why is it essentially different? It is essentially different because the social relations of production are essentially different. The similarity is only formal. Gilles Dauvé completely ignores the social relations under which labor is carried out. This leads him to the ridiculous and again ahistorical assertion that any measurement of labor time leads back to capitalism. This leads him to also reject any planning in communist society. Marx saw planning of production in terms of labor time a means not only to ensure society's needs are met, 
but also to bring about the reduction of necessary labour time and increase the disposable time for human development, as the quotation above indicates. In communism, he sees the development of human capacities and powers as ends in themselves and as representing the true wealth of society. But these ends will be achieved by social allocation of labour time. As communist society progresses from the lower to the higher stages, the antithesis between, the direct, between direct labour time and disposable time, which exists in bourgeois society, will be eroded and disappear. Direct labour time will come to serve the development of the individual as much as disposable labour time. Distribution of the social product. We have noted above that the relations of production are primary, and once they become communal, the relations of distribution will become communal also, and that communal production does not entail production of value. Marx, in his critique of the Gotha program, makes this point clearly. Within the cooperative society based on common ownership of the means of production, the producers do not exchange their products. Just as little does the labor employed on the products appear here as the value of these products, as an objective quality possessed by them, since now, in contrast to capitalist society, individual labor no longer exists in an indirect fashion, but directly as a component part of the total labor. Clearly, in Marx's view, once communal production is established, labor does not take the form of value, and hence the law of value no longer exists. However, writing about the initial phases of communist society as it emerges from the womb of bourgeois society, Marx suggested that distribution should be controlled by labor time certificates or vouchers. He proposed this as an initial means of bringing relations of distribution into harmony with those of production. He stated, the individual producer receives back from society after deductions have been made exactly what he gives to it. What he has given to it is his individual quantum of labor. For example, the social working day consists of the sum of the individual hours of work. The individual labor time of the individual producer is part of the social working day contributed by him, his share of it. He receives a certificate from society that he has furnished such and such an amount of labor after deducting, deducting his labor for the common funds. And with this certificate, he draws from the social stock of means of consumption as much as the same amount of labor costs. Much of the discussion of transitional society has been taken up with this proposal. It has been attacked from many quarters as either as a dis disguised system of money or a value system without money, which retains the law of value. Gilles Dauvé takes the second view. What these critics are really arguing is that the system of distribution will determine that of production. As we have argued above, this is inverting the relationship between relations of production and those of distribution. Is this a possibility? We have argued above that in the, in the initial phases of communism, retaining money would be suicidal because money represents exchange value and since it, it circulates and can be accumulated, it is a direct path back to capitalist production. Labor time vouchers are not, however, money, nor can they be accumulated. In a short passage in Capital Volume 2, Marx writes, In the case of socialized production, the money capital is eliminated. Society distributes labor power and means of production to the different branches of production. The producers may, for all that matters, receive paper vouchers entitling them to withdraw from the social supplies of consumer goods, a quantity corresponding to their labor time. These vouchers are not money. They do not circulate. Marx is clear that these tokens are no more money than a theater ticket. Rather than retaining value production, the labor time vouchers complement socialized production relations and represent a break with value production. It can be seen from the quotation above that Marx categorically denies that, pr that products take the form of value in the lower phases of communist society. There are a number of reasons for this. Labor in transitional society is not alienated labor. As we have mentioned above in a society of freely associated workers based on common ownership of the means of production and control of the entire production process, an individual's labor is socially owned. 
It is directly social in character and belongs to the freely associated workers themselves. It is therefore not alienated labor. We have noted above how Marx showed that in earlier historical systems of production, where labor was not alienated, but remained the property of the laborers, labor did not take the form of value and become attached to the products of labor as exchange value. Labor can serve as the substance of value only if it is alienated labor. Consequently, in the transitional society described by Marx, labor will not take the form of value because it is not alienated and the law of value will not operate. Average socially necessary labor is abolished. If labor does not take the form of value products, or if labor does not take the form of value, products will not take the form of commodities. However, Marx's critics assert that the actual exchange of labor time for equivalent labor time products operates on the basis of the exchange of equivalent values and amounts to a retention of the value system. Exchange value, exchange value, value will, exchange value will, they assert, creep back through this distribution system and undermine the socialist production system. The exchange of value is, however, only formally similar to that under capitalism. The content of the exchange is entirely different. Under capitalist production relations, it is human labor in the abstract which serves as the substance of value, and it is only the socially necessary labor which, deter which determines the exchange value of commodities. Under the labor certificate distribution system, Outlined by Marx, the exchange of labor and means of consumption is based on the actual labor time. Hence, in the lower phases of communist society, although there is exchange, it is an exchange of activities measured by actual time, not socially necessary time. The socially necessary labor time, which determines exchange value under capitalism, will not exist. If socially necessary labor time is abolished, human labor in the abstract which is the component of socially necessary time, will also be abolished. The components of exchange value, abstract labor time, and socially necessary labor time will therefore no longer exist. Exchange value will therefore cease to exist. Money, because it represents human labor in the abstract, will also cease to exist. Labor becomes directly social. In capitalism, since labor takes the form of value because of its alienated nature, and the social character of labor only appears when commodities confront each other in the market, the social, the social character of labor is therefore indirect since it is manifested behind the backs of the producers in the process of exchange within the capitalist market. The result of this is that the social character of labor appears to belong to the products of labor themselves. As Marx points out, social relations in capitalism are crazy. Instead of social relations between producers, capitalism creates social relations between products or things. In Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1, he writes, In other words, the labor of the individual asserts itself as part of the labor of society only by means of the relations which the act of exchange establishes directly between producers. To the latter, therefore, therefore, the relations connecting the labor of one individual with that of the rest appear not as direct social relations between individuals at work, but as what they really are, material relations between persons and social, social relations between things. Marx's critique of capitalism is directly or is directed primarily at the alienated nature of human relations under the system. Dead labor in the form of capital dominates living labor, exchange value dominates use value, and abstract labor dominates concrete labor. The world is upside down. In communist society, as described by Marx, things are turned the right way up. Here, an individual's labor is clearly part of the social aggregate labor and is therefore directly social. Relationships are transparent. There is exchange of activities. So many hours of one type of work, less deductions are exchanged for an equivalent amount of work producing food, shelter, energy, etc. The social nature of work is directly apparent. Dual character of labor abolished. 
Labor under capitalism exists as both concrete labor and as abstract labor. The concrete labor is that which produces use values, such as steel, fishing, electricity, etc. While labor in the abstract produces the exchange values of these things. Human labor in the abstract is the content of abstract value. The abolition of abstract value, therefore, means the abolition of abstract labor. Only concrete labor remains. The labor employed in the production of products cannot, therefore, appear as the value of these products. The products will simply be use values. Thus, we will have production of use values without the production of exchange values, something which, as we have seen, Gilles Dauvé argues is impossible. Labor Certificates and the Higher Phase of Communism Labor certificates as a means of distribution is something Marx proposed for the lower phases of communism as it emerges from capitalist society. It is important to understand that this is a transitional measure which operates as a link between the initial phases of communism and full communism. It will disappear in the higher phase of communism. As more products become distributed freely in freely what as more products become distributed freely increases the labor hours deducted for the social fund will increase and the exchangeable labor hours will reduce the value of the labor certificate will therefore reduce until it finally disappears entirely in the higher stage of communism this distribu distribution system is a comprehensible link from the lower phases of communism to the higher phase of course, as Marx puts it once, the springs of cooperative wealth flow abundantly, the actual hours of labor will also reduce. In full communism, each person will contribute according to their ability and each receive according to their needs. Such a society can only be created after a period of radical change in which the productive forces are refashioned to meet mankind's needs, controls over population and environmental de degradation, established and the hangovers from capitalist society are stripped away. The defects of transitional society in general and the labor certificate distribution method in particular have been pointed out by many critics. Marx himself pointed out that distribution according to labor time was unjust as it took no account of an individual's needs. Such defects, he argued, were an, in an inevitable result of the new society having to be born out of the womb of capitalist society. However, it is completely incorrect to argue, as Stalin, Trotsky, and others have done, in attempting to camouflage the true nature of Russian state capitalism, that Marx considered wage labor and value production would be an inevitable feature of the lower phase of communism. This is utterly untrue. The numerous quotations given above and the critical section of the critique of the Gotha program refute this. All this is, of course, not to deny that there remain a host of practical problems which transitional society will need to solve. Workers' councils will have to continually struggle to plan for human needs, to increase free distribution of products, and to stamp out attempts at reinstating value production. What we have at present is only a general outline of the transition from capitalist to communist society, and some pointers to guide us. But this outline remains theoretically correct, <clears throat> correct despite attempts to discredit it.